I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you're watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us. PBS Books, in collaboration with the American Indian Library Association, is pleased to host today's conversation featuring trailblazing women writer and Pulitzer Prize winning author Louise Erdrich, author of The Sentence. The Sentence is a New York Times bestselling novel in which National Book Award winning author Louise Erdrich creates a wickedly funny ghost story, a tale of passion, of a complex marriage, and a woman's relentless heiress. Let's meet the author. Louise Erdrich, a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, is the author of many novels as well as volumes of poetry, children's books, and a memoir of early motherhood. Her novel, The Roundhouse, won the National Book Award for Fiction. Love Medicine and La Rose received the National Book Critics Circle Award for Fiction. Erdrich lives in Minnesota with her daughters and is the owner of Birchbark Books, a small independent bookstore. Her book, The Night Watchman, won the Pulitzer Prize. A ghost lives in her creaky old house. It's my pleasure to welcome Louise. Hi. <laughs> uh, we're so glad to have you. Thank you so much for being here today. It is such an honor to moderate today's conversation. We are so pleased to have Alison Waka. Alison Waka, Menominee and Navajo, resides in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and works in community engagement. Allison currently is a vice president elect with the American Indian Library Association and one of Library Journal's 2021 Movers and Shakers. Allison's professional interests include exploring library land acknowledgement practices, developing community-led library programs and elevating the voices and perspectives of her native community. Welcome, Allison. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, hi, uh, Allison Waka. I am a nominee in Navajo and my clans are Tatnazani and Awasa. And I always like to acknowledge my parents, uh, Mary Alice Sosi and Lawrence Waka. So we are here today with, uh, I, I feel like this is the highlight of, of my career. And I am here with Louise Erdrich, who is um, somebody that that we have looked up to here in the Twin Cities quite a bit here in Minnesota, especially. And um, really excited to talk about the sentence. Um, it is, uh, a book that I think really means a lot to us here, especially in Minneapolis and um, after the pandemic and um, George Floyd that has happened here. So this is uh, really, it was, it was right after. So I feel like this was able to be published quite quickly, which is nice. And it's such a privilege and honor to be here. And would you like to do an introduction, Louise? I would. Mm -hmm. And by the way, do you have a large print edition there? It just looked like a huge book. It's a library book. It's the library. Yeah. So I, I am a, my, you know, my sister goes more towards uh, purchasing the books, whereas I go towards, I, I right. like the library. <laughs> okay. I will introduce you. Louise Erdrich, Indigenous Cause, Jagannath Moen. Indigo. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Turtle Mountain Chippewa is my Ishkonagan Wangi Bayan Uedi Bwana King. I'm from the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa. That's also Ojibwe or Nishinaabe. And um, my home reservation, um, where my mother, Rita Gorno, grew up is in North Dakota. And this book is really about, it's about a bookstore, uh, but I think libraries are full of ghosts too. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure, sure. yeah. We're ready to talk, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this, I feel like um, to talk a little, 
a little bit about the bookstore. Um, it, it is a gem of, of Minneapolis, I have to say. So if you ever are traveling through Minneapolis, please stop by. Um, and it, it, I, and that's one of the things that I really loved about the book is that um, I rarely get to read a book about somewhere I have been, right? It's all about like New York City or, you know, all these other places. And I can say I was here. And, um, and also when my son, my, my son will definitely read this someday, right? And right. he'll be like, I got to play in the, the birch bark house. And, you know, this will be, I think, something that will mean a lot to us, um, us, you know, here in the Twin Cities, but also our children. And so uh, I thank you for that, for including a, a place in that, that I have been, you oh, know. No, <laughs> thank you. Really good. That's really yeah. great to hear. Yeah, it's really lovely because I never get to, you know, one, I you we rarely get to have Native authors, but then one that we can associate with the location. And if you have never been to Birch Bark, I encourage you to visit. It's like, I, I think my favorite thing about it, too, is like when you first walk in, you smell sweetgrass and like you smell, you like feel at home, right? You feel that welcoming where... Um, it's just a really wonderful place to, um, to be. And I would have to say my sister agrees. So there is, you know, I don't really usually read acknowledgements in detail, but I do in the book because there is a special name in the acknowledgements. Um, my sister's name is here in, in the back pages. So, so you name the staff and my sister Alicia was a staff member at uh, Birch Bark mm -hmm. way back when, I think, you know, before we were both mothers, Alicia had just moved here. And I really love the acknowledgements. I feel like um, if, if, when you pick up the sentence, make sure you read the acknowledgements. Um, it, it really kind of ties in, I think, to the people that are special, um, your sisters, your family, it really is very personal. And I really appreciate the acknowledgements. And I know my family and I, I you know, we never get to see um, Waka in print, right? <laughs> and um, Menominee's, Menominee's have reached out to Alicia and been like, we never get to see like a native word that we know, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, you, you just touched all, all across our whole tribe and our family, and we just really appreciate that. So just to talk about uh, your book, Birch Bark Books, and is the setting for much of this novel, your character in your own book, the bookstore owner, um, and events of this book focused on many things that occurred in Minneapolis during the pandemic. Was your book inspired by your personal experiences? In many ways. Um, and the Louise in the book is sort of a comic foil. It's not really, some of it's like me, but a lot of it is uh, me being a comic foil to the comic foil um, that I, I created named Tookie, who's also an alter ego in some so many ways. Okay. Um, so many of the characters in any book that I write, and I think in general, writers write are part of part of our uh, personalities that don't see the light of day all the time. You know, they're hidden pieces of ourselves, really. Yeah. So, so being able to write about um, uh, writing Tookie's voice uh, and being able to write about Louise through Tookie's eyes, who, you know, Tookie's kind of fed up with Louise a lot of <laughs> my my main character, Tookie. And um, um, Tookie is the, the, the subject of a haunting in the bookstore. You know, this, it, it is based on a lot of what happened. And I'll go into that because it does touch on what you say about the book coming out quite quickly. So I had written this book over and over and over. I mean, it, it had been years when I kept going at this book and I'd always get stopped at some point. So, and it, I always started it 
on All Souls Day because I knew it was about a haunting and I wanted to be about this time of the year when things grow very uh, dark and, and quieter and colder, and especially around here, you know, it's, it's uh, obviously throughout cultures, it's kind of the spooky time of year when you're looking toward winter. And so I wanted to write about starting that day. In 2019, I finally was fed up with all of my um, problems with the book. And I promised myself I would start this book, uh, All Souls Day 2019, and I would write through no matter what happened. I would not give myself any excuses. And then, of course, in 2020, the world shifted and changed so so many things changed for us um and as it says in the end you know there's not only there was a pandemic that threw everything up into the air and threw our health care system into um a, a, a sacrificial frenzy um i have family who are healthcare doctors, nurses, you know, in um, being in health service and in the, um, the, the lo a local hospital here. So I wanted to write about what that was like, the pandemic, and then of course with George Floyd, a worldwide reckoning, something that started basically down the street from um, places so many people the, the center of the city, you know, and I wanted, I, I couldn't look away from it. It was right here. So I kept going, even though I did not and still do not feel adequate to address what happened. Mm -hmm. but you get stuck with that as a writer, um, adequate or inadequate. Once you make a decision, you have to keep going. So mm -hmm. I did my best. Well, you did a great job. I think it um, was when it happened, when George Floyd happened, you know, we saw it on the news here in the cities and you really like, I, as a BIPOC person, indigenous person, you really, I just thought, oh, it's just going to go away. We're not going to hear anything of it. You know, mm -hmm. during that day, you really, um, what's going to happen? What's going to change? Nothing. Right. Right. And here we are years and it, George Floyd will live in memories forever. Right. And so um, it's really change can happen. Um, and I think with uh, natives, especially to one thing that we struggle with, I, 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 you might agree, I don't know, but uh, about invisibility a lot of times. And mm -hmm. I feel like our BIPOC communities feel that as well. And that was one time where it was seen and heard mm -hmm. uh, throughout the country, out throughout the world, really. Yes, throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't know that we mentioned this, but Birchbark Books is a native centered bookstore. So mm -hmm. that's our, um, that our mission has always been to address the problem of invisibility or the problem of, you know, a, a sudden, oh, remembering that there are Native people, you know, that there are Native people in the country, Indigenous people all throughout the world, but then an immediate turning away and forgetting. So the bookstore was started in um, 2001 to try and address this exact phenomenon. And what our mission has always been is to bring literature and history and um, poetry and books, particularly by Native American writers, to 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 people all over the. Now it's all over the world. You know, we get we get people, we, we get what what amounts to a pilgrimage every summer. Anyone who comes into the city might drop by the bookstore. Um, and so we've become a center 
for teaching in some ways. And that's not easy for the staff. As, as oh, you yeah. learn in the bookstore, it's not easy to be a person. You're working in a way that um, is very demanding. Yes. And, and so I, especially at the end, appreciate um, the, the Birchmark Books staff, people who answer those questions and, and, and talk to people about native books and, and general books, you know, it's, yeah. it's a tiny place too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so tiny. <laughs> but it, it, it makes it feel like home though. It makes it feel, um, you know, once you get bigger and you get into it, it, it's, it is hard, but I, I have, run to Nadine last minute and uh mm -hmm. you know uh, every and Anthony and everybody they have always helped me out with purchasing Our present people. staff yeah yeah just amazing staff and yeah. um always a phone call away and really um the the book story though to bring that I did have one part of the book that was kind of interesting to me is the uh cow cowbirds and um oh, so I yeah. wanted to ask you about like how does that, you know, people place their books onto your shelves? And do you find those a lot? Do you ever happen to read through any of them? Or is, you know, just to give a little more information yeah. on that part of the book? Yeah, um, there's a, a part in that um, is explained during inventory, in which people find books that we didn't order and that people brought as gifts and put into whatever section, like you might find some um, self-published novels in one, one section or another, you know, poetry. Um, and they're kind of there quietly. And sometimes someone will come up to try and buy one, but most of the time they, they they just buy their time until inventory and then then we find them and yeah. it's I I feel I feel um, that they're given as kind of gifts and we really don't have a way to sell them because we don't we have to deal with them in our publishing system they have to be entered from a publisher and all of that so so. Um, I have a little shelf of them throughout the years. Oh, that's so, it's really nice that you look at it as a gift and not as a nuisance. I think that's really, really, really nice and respectful. Not that I want more, but. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you, I'm sure as an author, you understand like how difficult it is sometimes to write and, and, and then share your, your I do understand so, that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, seeing something you made in print between covers. There, that's a that's an enormous um, gra that's gratifying. Yeah, yeah, to see your name in print and um, with this book that you have a part where the the dedication to to bring it says from time of birth to the time of death every word you utter is part of one long sentence. Your book intertwines stories, fiction, nonfiction, and you weave a beautiful pattern of life, death, and we all go through what we all go through in between. How um, did, so it's, could you maybe speak about the, the title of the sentence? And um, is this, are you speaking more of like what your dedication is, is, is stating? I want to thank the author um, of that, that quote, whose latest book is Wet Hex. And what a great title, right? Um, so she is a, a local poet as well. And um, uh, I forgot your, I'm sorry, what was your question? No, just, is that how you came up with the title? And oh, um, no, I've always had that title because it, it operates on so many levels. You know, a sentence is, um, there, there's, it, it's the basis of the bookstore, of course. It's, we have, perhaps millions of sentences in the bookstore or thousands. I don't know. Anyway, we we're based on sentence. That's my life. Um, putting together sentences all day uh, or as many hours as I can. And it, it's the, it's, it's the way people 
who write live, you know, this, this very um, tiny unit of meaning comes to, to embody your whole, your whole life, your world. And that's why I love the, um, the dedication. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's also, a sentence is also, of course, um, a punishment. It's a, it, and it's something that you have to serve. You, know, you serve out a sentence. And writers are in service to their sentences. There, it goes on and on. There's so many. Yeah. There's so, so many. many yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I like that, that there's so many different ways you could take that um, that that title and what it means to you. And um, how did you come up with, if you could tell us a little bit about the main character, Tookie, um, how, did, how did we come up with that name? It feels like an auntie to me. It feels like an auntie name. Um, I don't know if that uh, was part of your intention, but um, how did you come up with the name of the character? Uh, well, I first, uh, there's, People who are, you know, that um, I guess it's a midship or Metis word for hat, took, took, and then tookie. I've, I, I guess I've heard of tookies. Mm -hmm. I, but it's, it's been somewhere in my consciousness that I, I couldn't really find access to because I don't really know where I, yeah, where I heard the name tookie, but yeah. it was. It was clearly the name that my character had to have. And um, Tookie's husband, Pollux, I mean, I don't know where I got Pollux. Pollux is a, a character mm -hmm. in um, Roman, you, you know, is it Castor and Pollux, the two um, twins who started Rome? Oh, sure, sure. It's, it's probably wrong. But anyway, um, Pollux. I love that name. Yeah. I haven't ever heard anyone. I like that. how original they are, you know, um, because they are very original. <laughs> Don't they sound like you've always heard them? They did to me. Yeah, like it is like kind of an anti name, you know, yeah. that you could think of, or we always have nicknames, I think, in a lot of native culture. <laughs> Every, you know, people always have nick nicknames. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I always love. Sometimes, I don't know, when you're reading a newspaper and they're talking about a, <clears throat> a race for tribal chair or someplace, White Earth or Red Lake or wherever, and um, Smudgy is facing off against Tuck. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I love, you know, that we have these, these people yeah. who get their nicknames. Yeah. Sometimes you never even know what their real name is, their birth name. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I love that. So, um, on uh, Tookie's nightstand, she has. There's the hard stack and the easy stack. Do you have a similar way of prior to, prioritizing the books you read? If so, can you name a book in each one of your stacks? Ooh, yes, I can. Um, right now, I'm I'm listening to I'm listening to some books. So I oh I I had a. Um, uh, a glitch in my eyesight it's just like my eyes get tired but it's going to be okay and um so i started listening to books too which you can my daughter has been doing this for years through the minneapolis minneapolis public library system so she has all sorts of recommendations and i started listening to the audiobook of michael and dodgy's war light Warlight a couple of nights ago. It's absolutely tremendous. It's beautiful. The other book I started listening to, um, I've been listening to Alice Munro's book. These are all my, I don't know, my easy sick or I don't know. They're to Tookie, they'd say she'd say easy, but they're not always easy books. These are <laughs> yeah. literary books. Alice Munro. And um, um, Robert Louis Stevenson, and I have never read Treasure Island. Mm. And my mother, uh, she was here. She just left yesterday, and um, she was talking about 
growing up in the Turtle Mountains and on this little remote reservation, growing up with a father who, who read all kinds of things, uh, newspapers, magazines, everything. And then everything you would read, you would pass on to a relative. So um, she had this gift from a, a friend who was leaving. And the friend gave her a book and it was Treasure Island. And it was one of the best things she ever had. A terrific book. I mean, that book is tremendous. It's filled with adventure. It's a young person um, encountering these vicious old sea salts <laughs> and his father's. You know, it starts out with this incredible character and it keeps going. And she loved that book. Aww. So I thought I would, would dip into that book too. Gosh, that's really a, um, a neat thing to do is like, I would, I think my, when I see my mom next, I'm going to ask her what, sure. what one of your favorite books. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really, that's really neat. And then, yeah. It's sort of like, a, you know, your dictionary in a little bit of way, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> in the acknowledgement, there's a, a piece about a dictionary. Do you want to say anything about that? Uh, oh. Just a moment, I'm gonna dip down here for a second. Okay. It just so happens I have it. Oh, no way! This is it. Oh, I love it. This is my, my, um, oh my so it's kind of dedicated to um, this dictionary in a way. Um, and I don't really know if I have the, well, this is something great that happened with this dictionary, all right? So this is a dictionary. I won this from the National Football League when I was in high school. And <laughs> dictionaries have been, uh, and eventually I ended up on the um, usage panel for the American Heritage Dictionary, and I was thrilled about that. Anyway, this dictionary, which I got, in you know 1972 becomes the dictionary that Tookie is you know this is this is it this dictionary but I found in the dictionary as you see in the back pages the um, a letter from the president of the National Football League I mean this doesn't happen anymore, obviously. Yeah. But this president wrote me, a, you know, there was a typed letter signed by this president congratulating me for my little essay on why I wanted to go to college. And um, I, I I mentioned this president's name. Then I got a letter from his daughter. Oh, really? Yeah, who was thrilled to read that her father's name and acknowledge that this my acknowledgement of how this dictionary had influenced me as a writer and what she said was that was my mother she read all of those <laughs> she probably made that decision and you know this was so i i love knowing the story behind it yes that's so lovely they con that she contacted you and to know that it was a woman behind the scenes kind of makes sense yeah. you know <laughs> And yeah. it really ties the ties to the book itself. How it, it does? Is, it's because, very. Um, Tookie is incarcerated and and considers that question, which all writers get asked this question at some point. What what is the book that you would take to a desert island? And I would take this dictionary. You know, I, I would never run out of um, interesting pages to turn to mm -hmm. and words to learn. I have no idea what book feels the same way. Would I take um maybe they're there? I might. That's the only book I really have read more than once. Oh I'm kind of a person that like one and done, you know? Really? And that they're there I've read multiple times. Um and so I've liked that one. Um, but I don't know what I would take to it. That would be a very hard choice to make. <laughs> hard choice to make. It is. It yeah. is. Yeah. Oh, cool. Let's uh for those 
just joining us, I'm Allison Waka, and you're watching PBS Books. I'm here with Pulitzer Prize winning author Louise Erdrich, and we are discussing her latest book, The Sentence. And now back to the conversation. And so um, one thing I think the book that, um, it, I'll read my question here and then we'll kind of maybe conversate about it a little bit, but the book portrays Native Americans uh, and indigenous traditions. In fact, the book addresses in Indian wannabes as Toki calls them. You know, I was Indian in a formal life or my grandma was an Indian. You know, we get the Cherokee princess thing, right? And um, like that woman in blue who wanted to share stories of grand whoever was um, helping the starving Indians, you know, you and I know that you know, pretend Indians exist and cultural appropriation is something that an issue we have to deal with. Um, is this is this book a way of bringing awareness to that issue, or what was maybe your intention of of uh, inserting that in the book? Well, sometimes you start something without an intention. Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't really have that as an intention. I only was intent on finding an identity for the ghost. Like why, oh. would, why would a human presence want to stick around this bookstore? And you know, I was just there last night and I walked in. And every time I walk into the bookstore now at night, I really, I feel like, <laughs> Pat me on the shoulder. <laughs> you know, but Flora is the name of this um, woman who who really couldn't get who couldn't get this sense of uh, a, a false native identity out of her system. You know, and she I, and and this happens. People become come close to native cultures and you know that the, the thing that's been said many times is that native people have turned more people into native people than or more americans into native people than americans have turned native people into white people it's just it it, it really is true that people seem to start taking on um a really passionate in wish to become native and so start mm -hmm. almost imagining um you know imagining some kind of reality or looking for some kind of reality where they some ancestor is native and this is what she does she finds a picture or is um presented with uh, whatever way she gets a picture and believes it looks like her and believes it's a it's an ancestor, um, and and this has happened with other people I've come across, and so I thought, well, why not let her be that person? Mm -hmm. Because maybe she would want to stay just out of a sense of longing. There's something missing in that person who wants to be a different person. There's some longing to be connected in some way, and I don't understand that. I don't understand the the reasoning, but it's, mm -hmm. it's very much there. Yeah, I think I think you you're right, and that it's it's something that's lost, that's something that's missing in their lives, and they're they're just trying to find um, something to connect with, and and there really isn't. I wouldn't say there really is any um, uh, sentence to um, being a pretend Indian either, right? There's really no, we can call them out and so forth, but there's really no way that you are in trouble, you know, for it necessarily, unless it's the, the um, arts act, you know, um, so forth, you know, so it is, it is a cultural appropriation, I think is something that, that is, is becoming easier and easier with stores selling and so forth. And, and um, so it, it but it, it's an issue that all of us really as natives have to face. I think a lot of times in either our work or um, and, and, and that sort of thing. So, and I think even with um, authors, 
it's it's really um, like Tony Hillerman or, you know, it, we are able to, um, I mean, Tony Hillerman was a book that I, I read, I couldn't stop reading them because I had no other native connection to books. Right. Right. Um, it, when I was younger. And so thank, thank you for your books. Now um, m our children have native books to to, to really see themselves. Um, well, that, that was another part, reason I wanted to have this, this bookstore to, to focus on native writers writing um, our own tribal stories. And um, you know, Tony Hillerman is a good writer, but it's very different for someone who has grown up with the, in the culture and who, I always think it's that you've grown up loving, understanding, not loving, being annoyed by your people. And I think that's very important to, to, to grow up that way and to know that they're your own people. That's the basis of so much. And um, I think the real problem is, has become, in a way, the academic world has, Native studies departments have, grown and flourished and so being of having a native background has been has meant job security for people and so and it's very hard for um people who come in and say that's who they are and you know make a convincing case even though it's very hard to check that out right right, right. it is yeah so um, there isn't a real way to check that out yet, but I think it's important because the thing I think about in terms of college teachers who, who are presenting themselves as native, the problem is that young people are learning a, a and um, they aren't learning a person who really is native, they're learning a person who's trying to, and impersonate. Mm -hmm. person so they're learning from that person how to be that's that's their role model and I think that's difficult I yeah. think that's a difficulty and I, I I think it's something that should be addressed it really should I think one of the things that we run into when when we're trying to be equitable is that we can't ask um them to verify right like I, I feel like sometimes we're at a, a really you know rock in a hard place where we're um, like for my position, even which was for the native community, um, we had about 30 applicants, I think, that were non native. Right. And um, it's just really interesting to me. And how do we combat that? And I think that one of the ways is just talking about it, right? And just bringing it into conversation. So that was um, good that the book uh, brings that in. Um, I have a few more questions. Um, I am a library person, whereas my sister Alicia is more of a bookstore person, but, um, what could you name, uh, I, I know what your favorite bookstore probably is, <laughs> but could you name maybe a favorite library of yours, um, that you've maybe liked at some point in your life, possibly? Um, so the, the, the town I grew up in, Wapiton. Yeah, it's Wapaton, North Dakota. It's about 40 minutes. Um, it's originally part of the Wapaton, Sisseton mm -hmm. um, boundaries, the original boundaries of the reservation, which is now the Sisseton uh, community, Sisseton Oyate. It's the um, it's a Dakota community. And Wapaton has an amazing library. Mm -hmm. It's a lovely uh old uh, building that was that was given as a gift to the town and um has steps going up and lions in the front little lions and oh. and i it, as i've been going back year after year after year um i've just grown ever more fond of the place it's changed a lot but it um it's presented itself to me during the you know, after the pandemic, it 
it became the place I would go to see who was around town and everything. Oh, sure. I started, I started calling it the nerd bar. <laughs> the place that people meet up in town, of course, are, are the bars. So I would go into the library and just see who showed up. And I reconnected with so many great people in the library. Um, oh, of course, you know, people are talking, people are looking things up. Um, people, I, I like to look, go and look through the old microfiche Live newspapers and um, so that that's my library. I, I love it. it. Yeah. I oh, love and my time I, in the library. Do you ever just um, go and and sign your books? Um, I, I would tell them why were you? Yeah, like, yeah. I do that all the time. If I find a book, <laughs> like in a in a um, thrift shop or whatever, I just oh, sign it. Oh, yeah. I love that. Oh, that's so Those awesome. pictures are worth nothing. You know, they're not going to be rare for anybody because I just want to sign as many books as I can. Yeah. So I have my, you know, the people like to know yeah. that the writer touched the book and has, right. you know, put their put their name on it somehow. Yes, yes. Yeah. It means a lot. It does. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so thank you for I'll that. Sign, I'll sign the books at Hennepin County Library. <laughs> Come over to any branch you would like. You are more than welcome. Yeah, over and over. And over and <laughs> oh, oh, I love that. So, um, my, I, I suppose my last question would oh, be if you could. Are we the last question? Oh, yeah, I think we're, we're nearing the end of my time with you. Um, but uh, I just, we would love to, to learn more about possibly your creative process. Um, do you have a special pen? Do you write? Do you type? Um, those sorts of things. And then I, um, then I know one author likes a certain song before he starts to write. Is there a song that you or music that you listen to? And then maybe what are you working on now? What do we have to look forward to? Well, I write by hand. Mm. So I, and I know that this is, it, there's going to be teachers in, in in this uh, audience so i truly want to congratulate anyone who is teaching cursive in their classes <laughs> because it's become an issue you know should we learn cursive of course we should learn cursive mm -hmm. we not go through our, the rest of our condemn our children to go through life without knowing a graceful way to communicate on the page you know of course, we have to do that. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, we could all be back to writing with uh, sticks and sand at some point here. We don't know, but at least <laughs> person, you know that, that would be wonderful. I, I, um, my grandfather wrote a beautiful script, and my mother and my father as well. So, I feel very strongly that handwriting shows the personality and the humanity of the person. Who writes? So for me, writing is um, this is my handwriting. It's a note to myself, so I'm going to take it away really fast. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I I really feel strongly about it because I couldn't do it any other way. I do type it in, and then I I'll go back and I'll go through the the pages, page after page, and make many, many handwritten notes, because I also feel that if you make, um, if you start editing on the computer, you lose your mistakes. And I believe, you, just as my character Tookie believes, that your errors are one of the most precious parts of yourself. Your errors contain something invaluable, that your errors are something to cherish and to learn from. So oh, I, that. I like my cross outs and I like to go back because sometimes my errors are the truth mm -hmm. and I go back and I find them. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. And I, well, my thought, I feel like printing your letters just is more time consuming than, than cursive. Like, <laughs> like I'm, I'm in a hurry <laughs> to get it done, you know, and like to pick up your pen and like, you know, I, 
Yeah, right. so I do love cursive. My I, one of my grandmas was a teacher, and she was just very about us. So mm -hmm. doing doing our, our signatures and and so forth. So, um, but I can I want to thank you so much for your time, and uh, this was just a joy. I it was like Christmas morning for me. I was just like so excited this morning to wake up, and um, you know, I slept with the book by my bed, and then. Yeah. Oh, so happy um, to to spend some time with you this afternoon. And I thank you and um, really uh, can't wait to to see what you work on next. So um, I welcome Heather back into the conversation. Hi, Heather. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me back in. We do need to close the conversation. And I just uh, Louise, I want to thank you for this incredible conversation. Thank you for your creativity, your storytelling, your grace, humanity. And I, I actually, I love, I loved your book. I also love your argument for cursive because I, I have this fear of prim primary source material is going to be like the next generation can't read it. And I know I'm a little nerdy and I know people think, well, the digitization, I am all in favor of digitizing but being able to read it because digitizing isn't perfect. So I am, I'm so there with you. And I was, I was clapping on, on my end, but the conversation, conversation was amazing. And Allison, thank you for your thought provoking questions and for the partnership um, with the American Indian Library Association. We honestly are so glad that we were able to celebrate Louise Erdrich, and, and as a trailblazer in this conversation during Women's History Month, more than a year ago, uh, PBS Books and the American Indian Library Association, we launched our partnership. And I will tell you, Louise, that when we started talking about the collaboration, one of the first people on the list of people that the American Indian Library Association members wanted to interview was you. So today was kind of the realization of a dream that we had a long time ago. <laughs> and that's we're so great. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Wonderful. My, you know, my, my grandfather, who was the person who um, I wrote the night watchman, I wrote about him would be thrilled to know there is me. He was such a literary person and this would thrill him. I also have to say um, that I need to say the name of the person who wrote that quote in the beginning. Oh, Sun okay. Young Shen. Sun Young Shen. Uh, author now of Wet Hex, as well as the author of that beautiful sentence that I mm -hmm. used to dedicate the book. We'll also try to, we'll make sure it goes in the chat for all of you out there who want to learn more about, uh, about the writer. Um, I also, in all of my programs, I'd like to, I always like to thank my library partners, more than 1,800 strong, and all of the local PBS stations who um, share this important content with all of you out there. It's very important uh, to thank you for watching this conversation. These conversations, we hope to introduce new books to you, especially during, during a time where we, we want to learn about new areas. Um, but obviously, I'm sure many of you already know about Louise Erdrich, who is such an amazing writer. So um, until next time, Thank you for joining us and, and we hope to see you next time. Until next time, I'm Heather Marie Montilla and happy reading.